you've probably heard about that, but uh, I know Dick is a friend and somebody I used to play basketball with, and, uh, and he forgave me many times for the things I did on the court. But I was the only guy that didn't get hurt. Isn't that amazing? You know, we had all those people hurt. You had a knee injury and, and all that. But Dick has always been available uh, for anything. Whenever I've called him for something, he goes, you know, I'll do it. And that's been really cool all those years that you've supported things. And I know he's done a lot of work in missions work in China and different ministries he supported here locally. But uh, the thing I remember the most is I asked Dick to uh, be in Dancing with Our Stars. And he agreed to do that. Connie remembers that. It was a, it was a great evening. And Dick actually won. So uh, he is quite a dancer. I asked him to bring his tutu today and uh, show a few moves, but he declined on that. But let's welcome Dick Lupke. Uh, well, he really understates it because Doug is the hardest guy to say no to. And uh, five years ago, he called me and said, uh, would you like to golf with me? And I said, sure. I love, I love golf. We get there, and I said, when's the last time you golfed? Oh, I don't know, a year or two ago. And uh, he only golfs once a year. So if you've ever been in a scramble, and he got real heavy. He got real heavy carrying around that course. And, uh, so when he asked me to speak, I said, well, what could be worse than playing, playing golf with Doug, dancing with the stars? Okay, this, this can't be that tough. So uh, anything short of dancing with the stars is pretty easy. Well, a little background on uh, my, uh, the business that I'm in. Uh, Pima Medical Institute is a uh, private vocational school, post-secondary, and it's in the healthcare field. So we teach uh, medical and dental assistants, respiratory therapists, riches from the respiratory department, nursing, uh, radiography, all sorts of things in the medical field. The school was started in uh, 1972. So we're coming up on 40 years next year. It was started by my father and uh, his, uh, his wife at that time. And uh, between, the, between the two of them, they had a, a blended family of nine children. And uh, it was a three-room schoolhouse is what it was. And so uh, you know, it wasn't until sometime later that I found out that he had to take a second mortgage to be able to buy this business. Um, Today, he wouldn't be able to do that, would he? No. Because I mean, you know, nah. Tim Overton is so stingy with his money. Nah. <laughs> that, uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, Tim is a pretty good bank. He's my banker, so uh, I wouldn't be banking with him if I didn't think he was doing a good job. But uh, it was quite a bold move for my dad to step out and do that. And um, it was several years later, after I had spent about seven years in the Boy Scouts, that I came on with my dad. Um, I want to throw out a couple questions this morning, because I think there's, uh, as I look back on my career, it's almost, uh, I celebrated my 58th birthday uh, on Sunday. And, uh, it's, and, and some of you know what that's like. So, uh, <laughs> I can see the gray hair, so you know what it's like. <clears throat> You're always stunned that on the person on the inside is so much younger than the one on the outside, and you say, how did I get to this age, right? Um, but looking back, you know, um, I see God's grace. I see God's grace in the way that he's worked with me, he's worked with our business. Um, and in the bio, I think I wrote in there that I'm probably one of the most surprised guys because I'm an accidental businessman. I never set out to be a businessman. Uh, all, the career, all the career counseling I got in high school was I thought I might want to go on to be a Catholic priest because I was raised in the Catholic faith at that time, uh, working with young people. But I never dreamed I'd be in business, and I never dreamed I'd be a CEO. So uh, really, it's... Uh, it's, it's, I'm the biggest surprise to myself is like, geez, how did I end up being a CEO? But there's a couple questions that, um, as I look back on it, <clears throat> Oz Guinness, some of you have read Oz Guinness, I know Jack has, uh, wrote a book called uh, The Call and Finding the Purpose of Life. And if, you, if you've ever struggled with this idea of what is your calling in life, you know, what are you called to? Uh, 
Uh, some people are called out of business. They're called out of business into full-time Christian work, and some people are called to a particular vocation. Oz says there's two distortions. The first distortion is the Catholic distortion. And if you're Catholic, don't be offended by what I'm about to say because it really has nothing to do with the religion itself. It's just basically a dualism saying that there are basically two tiers. There's the, there is the clergy, somebody that's in full-time service, and then there's secular work. There's the contemplative, which is what a priest would give himself to, and then there's those that are in action. Okay, so there's a dualism there. <clears throat> However, the pro if you're feeling smug because you're a Protestant, don't. Because he says the worst one is actually the Protestant. The Protestant distortion is that we take God out of the calling of vocation, and we come to, we come to church on Sundays to get our fill of God. And there's really not all that much calling within our, our Monday through Friday work. And that's the Protestant distortion. <clears throat> he goes on to say that um, there's basically two callings that we have. The first calling is our primary calling, and that calling is, is to be followers of Jesus Christ. And the second, the second calling is to recognize the gifts and abilities that you've got and put them to use to the glory of God. And if you, to the degree that we can actually merge those two together, uh, that's the true calling. So I want to share, before I share more of my story, I want to share a, a story. It's about two caterpillars. It was made famous back in 1972 by Trina Paulus. And it's called Hope for the Flowers. And there's these two caterpillars. The first one's name is Stripe. Stripe is hatched out of the egg. And the first thing he does in life is he eats the leaf that he was born on. And he finds out that <clears throat> eating leaves is what life is all about. But then he, he gets nervous about it. He goes, there must be more to life. And he looks up and he sees the sky and he says, you know, that must be where I need to go is up. So... With a little bit of effort, he finds himself at the bottom of a pillar, the pillar of caterpillars. And he decides to start making his way to the top to get to the sky. Because the sky looks so inviting, and he figures, i got to get to the top. Because there must be something at the top. He makes his way up, and halfway up he meets this other caterpillar, and her name is Yellow. You can assume that she's the color of yellow. And they're both making their way up to the top, but they're having to crawl over everyone to get to the top. And some other caterpillars are getting knocked off, they're getting hurt, they're getting trampled on, just to get up to the top of the pillar. A little bit ways up on the pillar, <coughs> Yellow decides that she's had enough. She doesn't like the fact that to get to the top, she's got to hurt others. So she slowly makes her way down the pillar, <coughs> and starts getting back to business of eating leaves. After a while, Stripe comes down the pillar. He does the same thing. But then he gets a little bit uneasy. There's a little knot in his stomach, and he goes, you know, if I adapt and I focus and I really work hard, I can get back to the top of that pillar. And so that's what he does. He just He's over all the other caterpillars to get to the top. When he gets to the top of the pillar, you know what he sees? He sees a bunch of other caterpillar pillars, and they're all scrambling, and there's really nothing else. And he, then he figures there's got to be more to life than just being at the top of the pillar. Meanwhile, Yellow is down at the bottom, and she's spinning her cocoon. And you know the, how the story would end. Yellow becomes a butterfly, and she ends up in the sky. She talks to Stripe, who's now frantically trying to stay on top of this pillar, <clears throat> and tries to coax him down the pillar, which he eventually does get down, and he becomes a butterfly as well. You know, I, I look at that story, and I see so much truism in, in our spiritual lives and our business lives and how they work together. For me... Um, first seven years out of college, I worked for the Boy Scouts of America, and I was a lot like Stripe. Um, 
I raised money, I worked with kids, I did whatever it would take to get the next promotion. And because um, I knew that promotions meant better money, better money meant better provision for my family. And so that's, that's what I gave myself to. Um, in 1983, though, I uh, learned a very important business principle. It's called the Peter Principle. Anybody know about the Peter Principle? <laughs> Some of you are shaking your head. Oh, yeah. You either have some in your business that are now uh, incompetent or you maybe tasted it yourself. But it's basically what happens when you get promoted beyond your level of competence. And I had accepted a very responsible position with the Boy Scouts and the large, one of the largest councils in America, in L.A., raising money with people that I had no business rubbing shoulders with and uh, did not do well. In fact, I would say it was, a, it was an abysmal failure. And so it was basically in that context that I jumped at the chance to come to work for my father when he called me. But uh, there's one problem. <clears throat> I was so used to hanging out with the people on the top of the pillar. I, we had just finished doing a dinner for Bob Hope. <coughs> Eating, you know, we were, you know, our, all of our business meetings would be at the Beverly Wilshire, the, you know, the finest hotels in Hollywood. And uh, I found myself the first week here in Tucson, I was eating at Roberts. <laughs> this is, Kenny, this is before they had upgraded the silverware, and you know they, the dishes were those, uh, you know, Jack. The dishes were about that thick, and you know you could drop them on the floor, and they, nothing would happen. Um, I thought, man, what happened to the fine china? So that's the context that that I came into the business, and. Um, it was pretty humbling. Um, fortunately, my dad was a man of, uh, uh, he was a pretty grace-filled guy. In fact, I'd say that um, while he did not try to preach or proselytize, you know, he lived a life that uh, was people-centered. People and I saw a lot, uh, a lot of things in the years that I, that I served under him that led me to believe that there was something better about where I was at that point in time. In fact, what I learned was uh, the more I could learn to die to myself, um, the greater things got. And the more that I would give myself to what I'm reading in the Bible and actually putting it into play, the better things got. When I put people ahead of materialism, just amazingly, God would bless. And you would just say to yourself, well, how is that possible? I don't know. Um, all I know is that God is faithful to, to bless us when we're obedient. Amen. Um, and so, <clears throat> and we started to grow as a business. And when you grow, you have more people. And the challenges change. Your job changes. Everything changes. Um, the things that I um, would encounter, I was not prepared for. You see, I don't have a degree in business. My degree is in physical education. Okay? And to me, that is just the funniest thing. I just, um, some people don't think it's so funny. <laughs> but I just think, how does, how does some, some jock, how does some jock actually end up being a CEO? Um, that is the grace of God. I mean, there is no question in my mind that he could take somebody that spent most of their college years <clears throat> learning, you know, different sorts of games to play with children and athletes and still somehow use you to do what you do. I think one of the greatest lessons was uh, teaming up with, uh, I had a very difficult situation facing me. I was about ready to fire a man who was a close friend of my father's and, um, Always be thankful if you've got men or women in your life that are a little bit older than you that can listen to your situations because um, that's, that's who God uses. 